Hey everyone. I am so ooh, <laughs> I am so thrilled to welcome you to the opening of Tell Our Stories: Artifacts from the Syrian Genocide. My name is Erin Hughes. I'm an assistant professor of political and sci political science and history here at Stan State, and run the Sargas Modern Assyrian Project that we have. It was my absolute privilege to be part of this exhibition, but the project would not exist without Kathy Syed Zatari, Dr. Ruth Camber, who is right here. <laughs> and Dr. Hannibal Travis. Kathy dreamed up this idea uh, for an exhibition that could capture family stories of escape and survival and building new lives from scratch and brought it to Ruth, who has done tremendous work herself on the Syrian diaspora in Yonkers, and Hannibal, one of the preeminent scholars of the Syrian genocide, and also our keynote speaker here tonight. Um, and so they took this idea to Stan State, and we immediately knew we wanted to be part of it, in part because the genocide itself is such an important history but a history that is not known enough and often sidelined by bigger narratives of the concurrent Armenian genocide or pushed into side because of continued issues with um, denialism. So to be able to help shed a light on this very specifically Assyrian experience and share this history with our students and the Turlock community is really meaningful to us. But what really stands out for me about the importance of this project is its approach to expanding our narratives of the genocide to include these individual family histories and these snippets of memories. That by hearing what people went through, we, our understanding is that much more humanized. It helps to build a more complete picture. As I was looking at the exhibition this afternoon, I was reflecting on what stayed with me the most. And I had these dual thoughts of resilience and loss and how interlinked these are. The resiliency to survive, to keep surviving on an individual level and as a nation is profound. But resiliency also requires something to be resilient from. And here the loss is indelibly interlinked. And so other parts that stay with me, looking at these beautiful photographs of families that are in the exhibition is how much bigger they should be, how much bigger more people should be there or of families where not all those who were photographed survived, that but for these tiny twists of fate who might not be here today. Which then returns again to making these achievements, building families, lives, entire communities in diaspora, and successful, bi vibrant, cherished communities, all the more remarkable. In an interview, Kathy mentioned the pride she has in what this generation of Assyrians did to survive, and I thought that was a really important takeaway I shared with her. This exhibition aims to interweave these snippets of family histories and personal stories with historical context and artwork reflecting on these themes of loss, genocide, and resiliency. It's not a lighthearted topic or an easy topic, but it's immeasurably important to Assyrian history and to humanity. And so I hope you have a chance to see the exhibition um, if you have not already. And I want again to so very much thank Kathy, Ruth, and Hannibal for their incredible work in building this. And I must also extend our extreme thanks to California Humanities. This project was made possible with the support of California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for Humanities. And it's also made part possible with the support of the Syrian Arts Institute, the Syrian Studies Association. And I want to thank our uh, Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Dr. Jim Tweedio, who has been such a champion of modern Assyrian studies and for his call and the college's tremendous support of the exhibition, as well as Dean DeCocker, Bradley Petros, and Corey Trodwell of the art department and the print shop for all of their help in making this a reality. Um, and so I will start things off by being so happy to introduce our provost, Dr. Rich Ogle, uh, to come up and say a few words. Good evening, everyone. As Dr. Hughes says, my name is Rich Ogle. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the provost and vice president for academic affairs here at Stan State. Uh, it is really exciting and it is an honor to have you here tonight. And on behalf of President John and the entire university, we welcome you into this space. We welcome you into uh, this exhibition and appreciate your, your being here tonight and being a part of this. One of the things that is uh, most important about being an institution of higher education and one of the things that I really appreciate that we do is that we are here to not only teach folks and provide degrees, but we are here to create and disseminate knowledge and experience. And tonight and over the course of this month, that's what this exhibit is about is to share, create, and disseminate knowledge and experience. And even when that experience comes from what 
as Dr. Hughes says, pain. In pain, there is growth. And that is what this is all about, is to learn from these stories, learn from this history, and be a part of the ongoing understanding. That is the reason why we are here as a university. And I can't think of a better opportunity in this particular space at Stanislaus State in the Central Valley where we have a rich and vibrant Assyrian culture that can intersect with our mission to create and disseminate knowledge to expand our horizons, to expand our understanding, to expand our sense of not just this very important culture and these very important historical events, but to be a, a compass needle for the future of how we continue to support and grow together. And so I appreciate your being here tonight. Uh, I encourage you to invite your family members, your loved ones, your friends to see this exhibit. We are so very happy to have it. We will continue being a source of creation of knowledge and experience around uh, our Assyrian brothers and sisters and colleagues. Uh, and we really want you to learn from this enjoy it, uh, tell others about it, and uh, have, a, uh, have a meaningful time tonight. Thank you very much. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dean Jim Tweedio, who is the Dean of the College of Humani Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Well, I have... Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting you uh, to share this space with us and to um, have an experience of um, a very tragic um, historical uh, series of events, really. Um, and one has to, to kind of wish that there were few examples of this to draw from, but there are many, and they keep coming. And we're seeing it now. Um, and um, we have to feel for the Ukrainians like we do for our own um, people. Um, we've seen it in Darfur. We've seen it for the Rohingyas. We've seen it um, in various places in Africa, um, Rwanda. And, you know, it, it's, and these are recent episodes. These are not the historical ones. but. Um, it reminds us that the human, the human uh, being is uh, a very complicated element of the world that we live in and has brought a lot of tragedy and senseless violence and has, in many cases, um, acted in ways that we have to come together later to remember and, and to um, try to share in a kind of empathy of experience for those who died, but also those who lived and made it out. Um, and when they make it out, we, every once in a while, you know, you get the story of what it means to, to, to survive. Uh, it's not a pretty situation either. It's a very, 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 uh, you know, it's very depressing. <laughs> and at the same time, we have to find our strengths and we have to make sure that we do what we can in the little places that we can touch to keep it at bay. I don't think we should believe we can make it go away. I think it's a menace to uh, the human condition that we're going to have to remain very resolute about um, confronting and revealing in, in every way. This episode uh, that we're engaged in now is an exhibition that is featuring um, the resilience and survival of people who left behind their lives, um, their families in some cases that were in graves. Um, they got spread out. We now have these terms, genocide, diaspora, these are terms that speak to the fracturing of um, people who, as a people, have, have lived with culture and history of their own over periods of time that helps to define who they are. I mean, think about your own culture and your own relationship to people and ask yourself, what happens to you when that's taken away, when that's erased, when there's an effort to erase it? It doesn't even have to be fully erased, but just the very effort 
and state-sponsored efforts are kind of uh, the ultimate uh, expression of that cruelty, and, and it's, uh, it's a shock uh, to, to recognize that it still lives um, with a lot of strength um, in the world, and we have a lot of work to do. But there is something that has to keep us going, and these exhibits, I think, are really important in that regard because they remind us, but they also give us the sense that there are paths forward, which hopefully can try to hold on to some of the ethnic culture and the history uh, as it manifests itself in, uh, in, in what remains of it, which is the now and, and in the possibilities that flow from that. Um, a lot of times these populations uh, define themselves by the land because they were indigenous populations. You know, they were of the land and, and they, they understood the land and they understood the climate and they understood the movements and, and the ebb and flow of, of the region that they lived in. And so to be purged from that is already a, a tragedy. And, and on top of that, all of the other emotional depth uh, that, that we have to experience along the way is, um, you know, it's, it's too much, right? Um, and they can't let go of the land because the land is kind of still the essence. Um, it's not just where they came from, but it's, it's, it's where their roots are and your roots are there. And, and it's important to remember that and to touch base with those roots because without the roots, uh, the rest is uh, going to have a hard time living. So um, it's, uh, again, I think some of these paintings are are very striking and, and uh, emotive and expressive, um, but they, they also represent a kind of cleansing voice for the artists and for those who can, can stand with them and experience them. And a lot of the documents and stories that have been collected, and you've done a great job to pull together a lot of documentation um, in, a, in a way that that members of a community can experience and not have to, to be an academic to, uh, to dig through all of the records that, that lie behind all of the understanding that we do have of these, of these tragic events. So I thank you, Aaron, and your team. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what, uh, what Ruth and others have to say. And I thank you all for coming and hope it's a, an empowering experience for us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Tweedio, for those incredibly thoughtful and poignant remarks. Um, your point made me realize I, the most glaring omission, and as I was thanking people, I forgot to thank the incredible people and families who shared their stories with us and without whom this exhibition and this whole narrative would not exist. Um, so thank you so much to those of you who did. Um, I am so excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, Sarah Bennett Kelberg. Uh, Sarah grew up outside Chicago and is now living in Hoboken, New Jersey with her husband, Paul. She's a senior director at a real estate technology company called Latch, based in New York. She recently traveled to Iraq and Gishri for the first time and is very passionate about her Assyrian heritage. And that heritage is particularly um, resonant for us here in Turlock. She is the great-great-granddaughter sorry, yes, of Isaac Adams, who was uh, the first Turlock, um, who led the first Turlock, sorry, who led the first Assyrian settlement here in Turlock. Um, so Sarah, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> yeah. I was told this would turn on. Good evening. Good evening. Shalom Alohan. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here tonight with you all and to share a bit of our family's story in coming to this country. I really want to thank everyone that worked so hard to put together this important exhibit. My family's being here tonight, we can thank to curiosity, passion for family history, but also the internet. Um, Ruth and I connected during quarantine. I was actually going on a really long walk. There we go. Um, listening to a Syrian podcast, and she came on telling this beautiful story about 
how she came to document her family's stories. Um, I just really fell in love with her voice and like the passion she had between preserving all of this because I feel similarly. And as I was listening, I really resonated with this passion that she has for preserving Assyrian identity, family narratives, and so much more because recent years, as I mentioned, I've been on a personal journey as well um, where I've been researching, documenting our stories, and connecting deeper with my Assyrian heritage and my family. So thank you again to Ruth and team for having us and giving me the opportunity to share how we're all connected today with the city and with each other. So as Erin said, my name is Sarah Bennett Kalliberg. I am the eldest daughter of Amy Bennett, formerly Amy Peterson, who is the youngest daughter of Esther Peterson, formerly Esther John. Esther John, who was my Nana, was the eldest daughter of Joel and Clara John, formerly Clara Adams, who was the eldest daughter of Isaac and Sarah Adams. Our family, like so many others, came to America genocide. There wasn't a term for it yet. The events at the time pushing our families to leave are similar today as they were back then, unfortunately, and these issues deserve our attention. I was able to spend a month in Iraq, Assyria, earlier this spring, and I really witnessed that firsthand. So I hope this story that I'm about to share with you really inspires you as much as it does me to continue to remember where we come from, why it matters, and to remember our people that are still there. In preparing for this, I referenced from memory stories from our grandmas growing up, sitting around, sharing stories, listening to each other, as well as a lot of other notes when I prepared last summer to tell this story and bits of the story on the Assyrian podcast. But in this research, I stumbled upon a few speeches that my Nana and my great uncle prepared for a speech in 2008. So I took snippets from that that I'll share with you here, um, just as a way to honor them since they can't be here today. In reflecting on this history, there's three themes that I really take away from. The first being a powerful legacy of faith, following the nudges and calls in our heart to lead, you know, wherever it calls you to, how God is calling you and guiding you and to know that he'll protect you and protect your people. Two, a love of our people. Um, Family history is really invaluable, as we know. Memories are sacred. They're important to be remembered. They're important to us as individuals, but also important to us as community. And so being proudly to be a Syrian, being proud to be a Syrian, excuse me, it can be as simple as what we're doing today, just sharing these stories. And the third is a responsibility. We really have a responsibility to ourselves, to our families, to this heritage, and then to the future. I personally think that we have a responsibility, you know, to really own our Assyrian identity, whether you're 5% Assyrian, a quarter Assyrian, 10%, 100%, 110%, whatever. Um, Really remember where you come from, why it matters, and then advocate for our people who remain there. Otherwise, these centuries of this really rich history, they're going to be lost on future generations. So jumping to it, I have right up here um, a number of books and documents that belong to our great Great, great, great. There's a number of us in the room that are different generations to Isaac Adams, who's up in the right-hand corner there. Um, The below is really fascinating. This is his Bible that my Aunt Sally, who's here today, generously lent us here today. There's also a snippet of a Syriac hymn, as well as one of his books called Persia by a Persian, an original copy, which was written, I believe, in 1910. So it's in delicate condition. But this history begins 100-some years ago in Urmia. Isaac Adams, my great-great-grandfather, was born in a village called Sangar in Persia outside of Urmia on November 28, 1872. He was unusually educated for this time, and he spoke Surith, Kurdish, Turkish, Persian, and eventually English. When he was six, he lost his father. Assyrian men regularly during this time would work far away in different countries um, to really get away from the Muslim villages in their area, and his father was no different. He went nearby in Russia, and he was actually exiled illegally to Siberia over a dispute over a passport. So upon that, their farm was then seized illegally by the lord of the village, and Isaac's mother was left with four boys alone. This is one of many stories of how Assyrians are regularly persecuted then and today, both violently and nonviolently in cases like this, to just push people off of their land. It's the same today in trying to remain in our ancestral homeland and villages, despite negative attention and um, persecution still today from Kurds and Turks. At just 13, Isaac, who was known, obviously, in the community as an Assyrian, was tortured by a local Muslim leader by the bastinando method, which is like the harsh beating of your feet. He was actually unable to walk following that for two months, um, simply because he didn't make eye contact with this leader um, walking across him you know, on the road. 
Following this during this time, though, you know, you can't walk, you're in bed for two months, he spent a lot of time reflecting, um, reading his Bible, and then eventually became connected with the Presbyterian mission after meeting Kasha Sayad, who was said to be, during this time, a gentle Christian patriarch. Um, our Syrian family was really, honestly, cautious of the Westerners and the Presbyterians at this time. I know a lot of us have had mixed experiences there, but in this case, you know, they really worked hard to earn Isaac's trust, and it became a positive experience for him, and he got very involved in the ministry and in the church. And so for two years, he grew and was studying under the Presbyterian mission, um, learning theology, learning English, and then actually teaching Bible and Bible studies um, in a bunch of the neighboring villages for two years and then at one point served as a church deacon, um, but through this time he really felt a call to do more and actually go to America to learn, but also to provide eventual safety for his family and his community. There's a quote that he writes in both of his books that really stuck with me as I reflect on this history, and it's actually a verse out of Genesis. It's from Genesis 12. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. So our grandfather really felt that call from God to serve his people, and he went across the world to do it. He writes, if I worship the same God that the people that wrote this book did, it's as simple as that, why wouldn't I heed that call? Which I think is pretty incredible. <laughs> I don't know if I would do that, honestly. Um, so he felt this call. In July 1889, he set off on this journey and left Armia with $5 in his pocket. He walked 19 days to the railway station where he got on at Akistafa. And then he was headed to America, to New York. He was 17 years old and he took the 18 day steamer trip by way of Georgia, um, excuse me actually, Georgia, Russia to Berlin. And then on the way, he was actually in prison because of a passport dispute similar to what his father experienced 11 years earlier. He was threatened to be deported and sent to Siberia, but he writes that he kept calm because he really trusted that God would look after him. The officials were apparently so shocked at his calm demeanor that they let him go and approved him to go to Berlin and didn't even charge him anything. So he still had his $5. He then took off on that 18-day steamer trip to New York. Upon arriving, he actually snuck in at Castle Clinton, which is still there today. My husband and I live in the New York City area, so we've actually gone and seen it, as well as with our parents uh, during the summertime. And um, it's this open area, and I was just imagining this story because it's so funny. When you get there, you needed $25 to get into the country. He had 28 cents, so he snuck in somehow under a fence. He was, he was a little guy. He made his way, um, and then he was in. And so he worked a number of odd jobs in and around the city um, on a farm in Patterson, New Jersey, which is pretty close to us. I know a certain fellow here that loves the grocery stores there. Um, he worked in the city, right in Manhattan, doing odd jobs at a hostel, um, eventually in Plainfield, New Jersey, which is fun for us because that's about 20 minutes. And so he worked in the States for five years to bring his brothers and his family back over for that first trip. During this time, he also went to Moody Bible Institute, which is in Chicago, to earn a theology degree. And during this whole period, he's advocating for Assyrians and working to educate about the Assyrian cause. And so he's traveling, he's giving speeches like this, um, talking about Assyrians, wearing traditional wear, um, and all the money that he would make from that, he would send back to Ormia, to his family, and to his people. And so then, in 1894, he made his way back through the Netherlands, through friends that he made in the States, and through Berlin. Um, he made this journey back and forth eight times, which is pretty amazing. Think about how long that was on those steamboat trips. I mean, even flying that much is just a ton. And so upon arriving back in Ormia, he learned that his mother died while he was gone. And her final words apparently were those that he'd encouraged her years before when he left. And right before she died, she said, all my hopes are in Jesus. On one of his earlier trips, heading back and forth between Persia and the States, he was actually captured by the Turkish government on his way to visit the Assyrian patriarch Marshmon in the mountains. The Turks were suspicious of him that he was a US spy because he was going to America so much. But Isaac was charming and like I mentioned earlier, just trusted that God would look after him and prayed to be delivered. He somehow was able to bribe a guard and then threaten them that he was in fact a United States citizen, which he was not at the time. Um, and ordered them to contact the U.S. Embassy on his behalf. And during this time, he was imprisoned actually for nine days. He writes that he had a really heavy iron chain around his neck for nine days while he waited. Miraculously, um, these Turkish guards were able to make contact with the embassy, and we actually have a copy in one of the books of like the stamp 
um, letting him free. So it's just crazy. So following this dispute, he then sued the Turkish government on behalf of the United States and won, and then used all of this money to send back to Urmia and bring the first group of mass migrations for Assyrians to come to North Battleford in Canada. So he gets back. Um, I read a number of different numbers on this, so somebody in the crowd can maybe correct me, but anywhere from 30 to 60 families was the first group that left. They went by way through Turkey, Iran, near Mount Ararat, eventually boarding a steamer in Hamburg, Germany, appropriately called the Assyria. They landed in Canada. Um, they actually then, they took a train and an ox cart to eventually get to North Battleford, where they knew they had land waiting for them. As you can imagine, the climate was not ideal. Turlock here was always the goal, um, but things fell through. They were just happy to be there. Um, they landed in North Battleford. So then skip ahead to 1910. The city wanted this land that Assyrians had to build a hospital. So Isaac worked out a deal to sell the land in Canada, and the hospital is still there today, mind you. Um, and he used this money then to go back to Persia and bring a second group of families over to come to Turlock. And so some of these original families stayed in Canada because they were settled, but then about half of them decided to go on to Turlock. Fun fact, there were two phones in Turlock at the time, the mayors and Isaacs. Um, during this time, he also went to Grand Rapids for a short period to study medicine. He knew that the Muslim communities back home really respected physicians, so he wanted to get that title to kind of earn their rapport and help with God knows what they would run into. Um, so by this time, mind you, he speaks a number of different languages. Um, he's a doctor in theology. He gets a doctor in medicine. He's a very busy guy. Uh, on one of his last trips, that he, when he came back to Persia, he went back and he married my great-great-grandmother, Sarah, who my mom named me after. In 1907, skipping back a couple years, they took another group of 55 back to Canada. And going back and forth during this time also, so now he's married to Sarah, his father-in-law was a prominent doctor who I actually learned today through our cousin Josh, was a physician to the Shah at the time. So I didn't even know this fun fact and through reconnecting and telling stories like the whole point why we're here today, Josh shared with me that our great grandma actually grew up in the palace with the Shah, which is pretty incredible. But still, because they were Assyrians, despite this prominence, they were still being persecuted. Um, things were growing more increasingly tense and worse with the Turkish and Kurdish raids coming through Assyrian villages. So Dr. Israel, her husband, was unfortunately murdered by a Turkish group then when he refused to let them steal his farm. He was hung in the town square in 1914. As we know, the world was slipping into the chaos of World War I, and then as we know today, as the Assyrian Armenian Greek genocide. So Isaac and Sarah sued. Um, Ruth, another fun fact, actually stumbled upon in her research the copy of the lawsuit of the United States versus the Turkish government on this, but there was not enough evidence to, to get justice for her father. So during all this time, Isaac is still giving his lectures. He wrote two books and sending again all of his funds to support the Assyrian community. The two books that he authored, one of them being on the screen here, um, that helped fund these missions. You can still buy today on Amazon, which is pretty fun. Persia by a Persian and Darkness in Daybreak. My great grandma Clara was the only sibling to move away to Chicago, and she married Joel John. She was a really wonderful woman who also really cherished telling stories. Sneak peek, Joel's sister, my great great aunt, the lovely Anne, who was Miss Assyria in 1933 Chicago World Fair. Her grandson, our cousin David, might be in the crowd, and you might be hearing from him in a bit as well. So Clara was the only one that moved, but she would regularly visit back in Turlock and come and see her family. And a number of Isaac and Sarah's other great-grandchildren are here today, and their families and our families continue to build incredible lives here together in Turlock. On June 4th, 1942, almost 90 years ago to the day, Isaac died after living the rest of his life here in Turlock when he was 70 years old. And Sarah went on to live another 30 years and leave a beautiful legacy. Last night, we were spending time at our cousin Leslie Adams, and we were all sharing stories over traditional Assyrian mail, heavy on the dolma, where we reconnected with cousins that we either had never met or hadn't seen since we were very young, poring over old photographs and trying to reconnect many dots. On the drive home, I heard my sister saying in the car that someday it's remarkable people in future generations are going to be sitting at their kitchen table pouring over our photos, trying to figure out who we are, who's who, who's so-and-so's parents, who their children are. So with that said, family matters, our choices matter, 
Remember to call your grandparents, your great aunts, your fifth cousins, your Ruths to put on exhibits like this. Um, remember to remember and continue to tell your stories because we're all living today because of the choices that our families made ahead of us and that what they survived through and what they continue to speak out against. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Sarah, for such an incredible, um, incredible talk, and just I can't get over what incredible life uh, Isaac had. It's just amazing. Um, our next speaker, as was foreshadowed, um, is David Armstrong. Uh, David is an American-born Assyrian filmmaker. As a member of the Directors Guild of America and a film industry veteran, he rose through the camera ranks to become a cinematographer. He served as the director of photography for James Wan on the Saw film franchise, one of uh, the key team members to create the Guinness Book of World Records highest grossing horror film franchise in history. Um, he has been developing his book, Dragons and Violins, a memoir of born music into a motion picture feature film or a limited television series. The book is a fascinating story of the extraordinary life of a Syrian-American immigrant, George Edgar, born, I apologize, I'm going to butcher his name pronouncing, Sargis Georges Yeager, um, David can fix that, <laughs> in Persia during the Syrian-Armenian Pontiac Greek genocide. Um, so without further ado, David, thank you so much. There we go. That's the cover of my book, Dragons and Violins. Um, so Ruth, Thanks for having me. Aaron, thank you for having me. Um, they asked me just like a week ago, would you like to speak? I said, sure. I, you, know, you know, I'll jump into the swimming pool empty. Um, and so I had, I had to think about what I was going to talk about, right? So I, I have some notes, but I do better when I just go off and riff. Um, as, I, as was mentioned, I've been a filmmaker in Hollywood for the last 40 years, but please don't hold that against me. I'm actually a good guy. Um, Hollywood's my hometown, and uh, storytelling is what I love. Um, I grew up with the stories of my grandfather. He told me so many stories. And, um, and I was trying to think about what I wanted to talk about, and I started thinking about... Um, you know, all the people that are connected. So you just heard from Sarah, who's my third cousin, right? She's from the Chicago side, the John side. And, uh, um, and, uh, and on the other side, my grandfather's side, from the New York side, is my cousin Pierre, who's sitting back there, Pierre Nogle, who's a resident of Turlock and uh, quite a prominent uh, musician in town. And I'll, I'll speak about him a little bit later. But I was suddenly, and this wasn't planned, that. I think back-to-back -back relatives would be up here. It just Sarah was asked long before I was, but um, but we are related. And 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 then I was thinking I was driving up here. I think this is the first time, probably since the 1950s, that the both sides of the family were in the same room, right? Because the New York and Chicago side, they they, they didn't travel a lot back then. So um, uh, this is a bridge that hasn't happened for a very long time. Um, You know, I was thinking about Assyria, the land of Syria, and I go, and Assyria is, is not a place, it's a people, right? Wherever the people are, is, there's where Assyria is. And I was thinking about what makes Assyria a land is the gathering and the people, and, you know, Sarah speaking, and the research she's done, and, you know, those, those acts that bring us together, right? I, there's the... Um, the, the, of history, the love of that, you know, the love of music, as my cousin Pierre is amazing at, and brings people together. Uh, um, you know, every time we gather, there is Assyria. Um, and it, it was something I really just didn't think about till today. Um, my grandfather was born in Persia in 1912. Um, I had spent, I recorded about 25 hours of video of him uh, getting his whole life on on, uh, on videotape. I spent uh, six years researching. I spent about four years writing. So it took me about 10 years. I started in 2000 and I published in 2010. And it's probably the purest in me as a filmmaker that I wanted to get it right because I grew up with a lot of stories. And one of them was, uh, there they are on the ship 
which was called the King Alexander, and they're in New York Harbor, and suddenly there's fireworks in the sky, and the people panic on the ship, and it happens to be 4th of July. But then when you grow up and you're like, well, I'm going to write this book, and you're like, did you really be, you know, were you really there on the 4th of July, or is that just something a grandfather tells his grandson, right? So being the purest of a storyteller, that I went and researched everything. So I flew to Istanbul and um, uh, Constantinople back in the day and went to the embassy where my great-grandmother had worked as a cook as they were trying to get money. My great-great-grandfather had came to America early in 1916 with the two oldest daughters to make money to send back from the, far, uh, the Near East Relief. And, um, and I have all those documents. And one of them, one of my favorite things is he sent after five years, my grandfather came in 1921. So after five years of working, he raised $500 to send to them. And there's this little note, hangs in my hallway. It says this is for my wife and children, the, the rest of them there, this $500. Should they decide not to come, they can keep 200, please send 300 back. <laughs> so frugal. Um, but they did go. Um, this is them. This is my grandfather right here. I was a very little boy. This is Nana Khatun. This is Nanajan, Sophie, and uh, Paulus, or Paul Edgar, and uh, his father, um, and, oh, and Maria down here. So this is before they came to America. This was probably about 1913. Right? And um, not looking like immigrants much back then, but I think things obviously changed within a year or two of that for the obvious reason. So um, they came on a ship called the King Alexander. And it was that name, the King Alexander, is how I found them, because my grandfather always remembered the name, but he didn't remember any dates. And I always took Fourth of July as, okay, something to, so I, something to draw on. So I found the ship's manifest, and this is six years of this research. One of the things I did was I found the ship's manifest, and the last name changed. I have five different documents with five different last names, and they're all changed, and, some of, and it was Kivergis. And I find uh, papers from the American consulate in the Caucasus where it's like K-E-O-G-R-I-Z. And then I have documents that say G-E-O, you know, and it just kept changing. It was for six years I couldn't figure out why they were all different. Then I went to Ellis Island and researched there and they said, well, when a married woman traveled on a ship in those days and she wasn't with her husband, she put her maiden name. That was what they asked for. And then I also, you know, as a growing up, you learn things like um, Ellis Island changed the names. And I, in my research, from what I've researched, it's not Ellis Island that changed the names, it's the boat that changed the names. Because you get on the boat, and it's, say it's a Greek liner, and there's a guy who speaks Greek who's trying to ask you your name, and he's listening and he's phonetically writing it down, right? So, and then they arrive in Ellis Island, they give those manifests. And so that's, that's the, you know, Ellis Island doesn't deal with the paperwork, they just receive the paperwork and process you. So that was a surprise. So I found this King Alexander, and not knowing the last name they would have traveled on, I just had to go through line by line and go through almost like a thousand names till I found the four names I was looking for in a row, which was Nana Khatun or Catherine, uh, Paulus, Maria, and Sargis but they had a K because they heard circus, like Armenian, right? So it's all, and Nanajan is Manajan in the manifest. So, uh, so all the phonetics. So I found them and they did. They were in the harbor on July 2nd, 1921. And they were processed off the ship, which I hadn't occurred to me. It isn't like you arrive and you get off, you sit and wait. So they didn't get off till July 5th, 1921, right? And uh, so that was a huge surprise. And as a complete, I don't know what kind of universal thing, my then girlfriend I was with um, came with me to New York. And she said, well, my, she's Italian. My grandfather came from Italy. And I said, well, why don't you go research and find out? And she comes back into the, the grand room. I don't know if you've ever been to Ellis Island. We're late to go to the boat. We're in, the, in this huge room. It's empty. The flag's everywhere. And I said, she said, oh, I found my grandfather. He came to America and was processed through. He came from Italy, etc. And I said, when did he come? And she goes, I don't know. And she pulls out the paperwork, and I kid you not, he goes, she goes, July 5th, 1921. 
and we're standing in the room and I, and just if you haven't been in that room when you walk in tears come to your eyes it it kind of catches you off guard and you just i think the hope of people is so embedded in the wood there and then Nikki and I are standing there with tears in our eye that both our grandfathers were processed through the room mine was 10 hers was 21 at the same time July 5th 1921 so take away what you will with that this is part of the overall document I have um, and actually if you see it upside down the big red ink it says scene Department of New York up there Took me a number of years till I looked upside down. I thought, oh, I just took, kind of took for granted seeing that. And that's my grandfather, and that uh, Nana Khatun and Maria coming to America. You could tell she's very excited to be here. <laughs> Tough lady. My, grand, my mother growing up in the 50s said her image of Nana Khatun was sitting in the dark, watching wrestling on TV, Drinking a Schlitz and a hookah. <laughs> and that was, that was her image of that one. And it, it's, you know, to raise those children and go through all that she did. And the journey was, you know, right out of Dr. Shivago. It was the whole train ride, the whole thing. And the irony is that my grandfather and my grandmother and Maria ended up in, in Constantinople all those years, from 1916 to 1921, Istanbul. So of all places, that's where they lived. And ironically, that was my grandfather's best memories as a child, because he says it was the only place that I was really accepted. Just for me, I, didn't, I wasn't dealing with, the, the war had been over at that point, and it wasn't you know, the history that we know. In fact, when I interviewed my grandfather, he came to America, he says, you know, I only had one pair of shoes, I only had one pair of pants for school, I only had, you know, I had acne, and I was this immigrant boy, and I had to fight my way through to be a tough kid, and he says, I, I, nothing, I wanted nothing more than to go back to Turkey, which I thought was such an ironic thing when you're sitting down to write a story, but I think there's, you know, the true heart of storytelling is that this is on part of the document, it says, I left my own country, and you fill in a date, 1914, for the purpose of coming to Tiflis, arriving in this country on April 5th, 1914, via Erevan, Alexandropol, Tiflis, by railway to save our lives from the Turks. There it is in print, you know? And it's just a matter of fact. So coming to America, now, that's my grandfather, the tall one. The other three are his two nephews and his niece because he was, everyone was so much older. Was Paul Edgar, his, his brother, was 21 when he was born. So my grandfather was uncle to people that were only two years younger than him, All right? My grandfather, 1931. Um, New York was quite the place for them. The, the violin was part of his life. He had, uh, he took to the violin very early, and that's through the through line of my book. It's called Dragons and Violins. And the violin was, uh, you know, his lifesaver in so many ways. And it was the thing, I think, that kept him from being, you know, in a gang. Even though he ran money for Dutch Schultz in the 30s, he had quite the life. Um, and uh, there he is, a little older. But the violin was just his thing. As a little boy, I, I lived a lot with my grandfather and, and, and going to bed at night listening to the violin play in the den was very much part of my growing up. Um, so later, there you got, uh, you have uh, Nanajan, um, Sophie and Maria, and Nana Khatun, happy to be on the roof, you can tell. <laughs> and my grandfather, he just got, it, just finished officer school and was getting ready to ship off to World War II. Um, pausing to say, you know, the book for me was about, it, it's an American immigrant story who happens to be an Assyrian, you know, coming from a country that, you know, we know about the genocide. I, I know of the genocide through my grandfather and through his storytelling, but I, I learned, you know, the genocide, so many things came out of it, but, you know, different lives. These people had to lose their land and come to this land, but then they made this their world. And for me growing up, you know, um, uh, Syria, was never something that was lost. It was just always at the dinner table. It was always stories, 
You know, my grandfather would say, you know, in the old country, they'd slaughter a cow, they'd cut off all the fat, melt it, and then you'd put all these chunks of meat into the barrel. And then during winter, they'd chisel out the meat and eat this grease meat. And he says, they'd live to be 100. I says, I don't know what that's all about. You know, I'm like, oh, okay, who are these Assyrians? And growing up in Santa Barbara, I only know four Assyrians. It's my uncle, my mother, and my grandparents. That was it. There's four Assyrians. That was my whole world. So um, writing the book really spread me out uh, in, into the world. And then Pierre, my cousin I've known since we were small, distant relatives over the years, we got closer. And, and uh, you know, his mother would say, oh, you guys are cousins. But I also learned any Assyrian in the room is your cousin. So... <laughs> so you know, so I, we never took it to heart, and Pierre and I did the 23 and Me last year, and there we are, third cousins. We both got on the phone, and we are related. And his mother's like, I told you. <laughs> so there he is, a uh, lieutenant. He's a combat engineer, D-Day plus four, all the way to outskirts of Berlin. He was a um, bridge builder. So every time the army moved, you look at any map, when the army got to the water and the rivers, the Rhine, the Ruhr, the Seine, the army stops. There's nothing you can do. You have to build a bridge. And so his job was, you build that bridge, we go across the bridge, and we'll stop them from shooting at you while you're building the bridge. So he had quite, uh, quite the career. He married my grandmother, Miss Ann John, who Sarah spoke about earlier, Miss Assyria, the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. A bit of a looker. Um, I could see why he proposed to her four days after meeting. <laughs> They rushed things back then, I guess. But uh, she said yes, and that's where New York and Chicago met. Um, their wedding day picture. Um, the thing I was struck about going into the exhibit earlier was all the pictures. Not that I wasn't expecting other people's pictures to be there, but I've always grown up with my pictures. And, and it was so fascinating to see all the other pictures because they were, oh, those are, I, I know those pictures. I, I've never seen them before, but you know what I mean? You're like, oh, I know those wedding pictures. I know that, you know, there's all that familiarity. And, and, and walking through the exhibit today really sort of brought home, because I meet Assyrians, but I don't see their pictures. You, you go to bars, you go to restaurants, you go to gatherings, nobody's whipping out all these old photos, right? So you're like, oh, but that really was the connection for me tonight. Um, more of their wedding pictures. I love this one, that hat of hers. It's just a killer. Um, and this is when they were dating. And this is him as a decorated officer in Germany and during World War II. So um, it's, it's been quite the story. It's got so many places it goes. I, I, I always pitch it as an immigrant story, an American story. You know, it is an American story of someone who happened to be a Syrian because we're a country of immigrants, despite what the news will tell you. We are a country of immigrants. And this is another photo of him. This photo is Chicago. This is um, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. So my grandfather, I didn't know this till after he was deceased, and I was interviewing Florence, his sister-in-law, Florence John. And she told me that he had really bad PTSD, which I had no idea. He, like, they told me he couldn't leave the house, couldn't drive, which was something that surprised the hell out of me because he was such an athlete. He, had, he, had, uh, he tried out for the all-around gymnastics in 1936 and was picked. But there was a man named Avery Brundage back then who said, if you weren't born here, you can't represent. So he wasn't able to go. So I couldn't imagine my grandfather, this amazing man, was afraid to walk out the door. And, and so he, uh, with the help of a woman named Ann Tischer in Chicago, who was a teacher of violin, got him into this contest. And, and it pulled him out of his shell. And he won that contest. And he soloed with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1956. And, he always told me, this picture always sat in his den, he said, uh, he says, I never played as, I, as good as I did that night. And he went on to found the Santa Barbara Symphony Orchestra and played in it for 30 years, but he says, I never got as good as that night. And um, this was him in later years. And that's me. <laughs> Probably scaring the hell out of him that I'm grabbing his violin. <laughs> 
But uh, this is my favorite photo because I can see how I feel for him in this picture. You know, it's, it's, what, it's what grabs me. Um, I wanted to, um, let's see. I wanted to talk about, as I started talking about Sarah, and Sarah said so much tonight, and, and, and talking about family, and my grandfather's brother, Paulus, Paul Edgar, who was the older one, he was a doctor in New York, if I can get this to cooperate, and this was him. This is his Persian passport. It says Persia. This is Persian passport, and he was uh, part of the Assyrian National Association in 1933. And um, like our families, uh, whether it was music or traveling or history or storytelling, was working to keep Assyria together. This is from him, the National Emergency Committee. Fellow Assyrians, in this hour of national crisis, we venture to ask you but one pressing question. And that question, a question presents itself in this fashion. Shall it be slavery or freedom? All right. This was his letterhead. He was with the uh, State of New York Department of Mental Hygiene, um, writing about why our Assyrians are massacred. If anybody reads Assyrian, they could tell me later what this says. But that's also from the National Association. And, um, and I, you know, I, this week I suddenly, I was planning on talking about my book, but I thought I had need to talk about my family. Other documents from them. And um, there he is in 1925. And one of the things I found in his possession was this. It says, let's see. It says, all quiet on the Eastern Front. Whom do they want? Your sons, your husbands, and your fathers. World's War, March 15th, 1916. And I thought that was, I think the word appropriate might be wrong, but you know, I thought it was the occasion to show that this was in his possession. And you know, what, what has brought us all here together was this. I um, last want to speak about my Pierre, about my cousin Pierre, Pierre Nogle who I love dearly, is an amazing drummer, amazing musician. And his grandfather, uh, Francois, right, Pierre? Francois, Francois Nogle. This is with the Shah, and these three Assyrians are working with the Shah to help keep safety and preserve safety of Assyrians back then. And uh, I recently got these from Pierre. This is when they were meeting with the Shah. And Pierre's grandfather then came and put the first down payment for the Assyrian center, is that correct? Do I have that right? The first Assyrian center here in Turlock, right? So, um, and like I said, it didn't, it didn't occur to me till I was coming up this week that, um, that how much my family has just been doing, either putting people together with music, um, my legal notes, um, you know, uh, Pierre has, has, has played with uh, Ashur, Ben Sargas, Linda George. He's traveled around the world. He's played Persian, Assyrian, and many other cultural musics. He's a fascinating drummer. And uh, his uncle and my second cousin is Robert Nogle, who's a master drummer and huge in the Assyrian community and world. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I hope you guys don't mind, I sort of spread out the wealth here tonight of, of how much my family and distant relatives have been involved and our, our acts of love, love of music, love of story, the love of sanctity of life, the love of a people's story and legacy. You know, every time we do that, any one of those acts of love, we come together and there is a Syria. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Have a good night.
Thank you again to David for such an incredible, incredible talk, and likewise, just such an incredible, inspiring family. Thank you. Um, so we are thrilled to have Professor Hannibal Travis as our keynote speaker this evening. However, Hannibal unfortunately fell victim to some of the airline tomfoolery that has been going on, and one of his connecting flights was missed. Um, so he is joining us through Zoom. Um, so I will give a quick introduction to him. Um, Dr. Er, Professor Chana, Tra Hannibal Travis is a professor of law at Florida International University, a uh, public research university in Miami. His research in Assyrian studies and in genocide studies includes Genocide in the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire, Iraq, and Sudan, published in 2010, the Assyrian Genocide Cultural and Political Legacies, published in 2017, Native Christians Massacred, the Ottoman Genocide of the Assyrians during World War I, published in 2006, the Assyrian Genocide, A Tale of Oblivion and Denial, um, in René Le Marchand's Forgotten Genocides, Oblivion and Denial and Memory, published in 2011, and Constructing the Armenian Genocide, How Genocide Scholars Unremembered the Assyrian and Greek Genocides in, Ottoman, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and that was published in tw 2013, and much, much more, of course. Um, he's an incredible scholar, and we are so excited to hear from him today. Thank you, guys. OK, uh, well, hello. Am I on now? Yes. 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 All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Hughes. Thank you, California State University. I apologize to the audience that I could not be there in person, difficulties with travel, and. Delays uh, interrupted my schedule, but I'll be presenting briefly on fractured stories of Assyrian genocides in the Ottoman Empire, Iraq and Persia, and of refugee flows. So I'm trying to tie in some of the material you may be seeing in the exhibit and hearing from the other speakers uh, with some historical and legal uh, background and context. So to begin with, uh, a few stories. Uh, recently, Edinburgh University Press published Seifo, an account of the Assyrian genocide, uh, based upon the writings of Abdel Mshiho uh, Naman Karabashi uh, and translated by Michael Abdallah and Lukas Kizko. And that has a story written in the monastery of Deir al Zafaran, and I'll be discussing how it shares a lot in common with two or three other stories written in different places or sent from different places uh, and from different perspectives. Uh, one uh, from Northern Persia, Northwest Persia, Salamis, actually from the Bishop of Salamis. Uh, second, uh, the writings of uh, Lady Surma de Beg Marshimun. Um, and some German and other writings that all say a similar thing, even though they come from different denominations of Christianity. Sometimes there's confirmation from uh, Ottoman Muslims and other Muslims, uh, as well as from other denominations of, uh, of Christianity. Uh, so to start with the, the story of Karabashi, um, he writes of two episodes, um, the first, the 1890s. And he's also talking about it at other times too, but specifically mentions 1895 when there was an Armenian uprising and uh, an attack on a bank and some related skirmishes and battles. And he writes that Kurdish tribes attacked an Assyrian village by surprise and began murdering men and children, taking the women and girls and plundering the houses. Then he writes about World War I, a different time, uh, 20 years later. Uh, and he says at that time, the war was accompanied by murders on civilians executed without any limitation, the plunder of churches, the pillage of property, hunger, the expropriation of children, plagues, and orphanhood. It was as grave in its result as if it had lasted a century. In other words, some countries had a 100 years war or a 30 years war, but the First World War for the Assyrians, people of Turabdin and Mardin that he was talking about, uh, suffered as much in those four, three or four years as those other countries had in a hundred years, losing a third of their population or something in the case of the uh, 30 years war. Similarly, the story of uh, Pierre Aziz, the, the, the bishop I mentioned, said that the Assyrians of Urmia and Salamis arrived uh, on foot in Diyarbakir, uh, reporting that they had lost everything, even their clothes and shoes, and that the Christians who remained at Urmia were all killed. 
And by 1918, he wrote that all the Christians had been killed except for some women and girls who had been taken captive. The survivors headed for most. Telling a similar story as that written some miles away, some miles west, uh, across the Ottoman Persian border, uh, but a similar series of atrocities that is, you know, today referred to oftentimes as genocide. Uh, Lady Surma similarly wrote, uh, many Assyrians were deprived of their lands for the benefit of the Kurds. In like fashion, whole villages of Christians were expelled in hundreds of cases from their homes, as was in the fact in the district of shams Dinan, and so on. Such of these property owners who were not killed usually fled much against their own will to Russia and settled for the time there. So we have the growth of the Russian and other diaspora, people who moved to Russia and moved on to other places in Europe or, or North America. Um, in 1914, 1915, which she's writing about. She said that a Christian who was a subject or a riot, a non-independent Assyrian in the Ottoman Empire had absolutely nothing that he could call his own with any security, no property security, no family security, and so forth. And as a result of the, the war, the nation had been almost destroyed. What about stories from other people? For example, the American press. They, they started writing about the 1895 events, uh, the American Board of Foreign Missions sent a cablegram to the Boston Daily Herald saying, in Harput, or Carput, they used to call it, uh, the Christian mission buildings, the foreign missions, most of the buildings had been burned down uh, and houses were being plundered. Uh, the United States was perhaps not prepared to defend its missions. Uh, although no missions, uh, no missionaries were killed, Villages, native villages everywhere are desolated and people are left without clothes and are starving. They need help. Similarly, the Chicago Daily Tribune wrote that the government was starving out the Nestorian Christians in the mountains of Kurdistan, also the, therefore the Assyrians. It is asserted that it gave these orders in the in mountainous region immediately west of Gavar, uh, midway between Mosul and Lake Van. The Armenian perspective, also, you know, a different denomination from the Assyrians, wrote that not only in the 1890s was the slaughter and sale of Christians of every age and religious right being carried out, but also the destruction of the Christian population by ruin, dispersion, cold, and famine. In the towns, no more prosperity was left, no more trade, labor, or industry, because a greater portion of the houses and shops had been sacked and burnt down. That was the Armenian patriarch, one of them. Similarly, the Germans and the Ottoman Sultan, who took over from uh, the Young Turk regime uh, after the war, the German ambassador early in 1915 wrote that the extermination of the Christian element from Turkey was going on without differentiation as to race or denomination. In other words, it wasn't only the Armenians, some other group, the Assyrians, Syrians, he called them, uh, and Chaldeans were included in this. Um, similarly, the, the Sultan signed a treaty in 1920 that referred to massacres perpetrated during the war, not only against Armenians, but against all subjects of non-Turkish race who were forcibly driven from their homes by fear of massacre starting at the beginning of the war, or 1914. The Ottoman Attorney General referred to these events as crimes against humanity, an article uh, recently confirmed which is the same term that the Allies decided to use for the Holocaust and so forth in World War II. But this is being used, uh, you know, 20 some years before that in reference to the Ottoman Christians. And this is a picture of the uh, president of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal, pictured next to this is Ottoman Attorney General uh, in an early picture. The Ottomans had a tribunal. Uh, there's a book about it called Judgment at Istanbul, there's other books about it. Uh, what did this tribunal say? They had a, a military tribunal, indicted Ottoman leaders for what the tribunal called, not foreigners, not Assyrians, the massacre of the population, rape, torture, and oppression, all without regard to sex, religion, or nationality. In other words, not only the Armenian nationality, uh, and a great part of the victims were from other communities. They were referring that passage to Armenians, saying that a great part were not. Armenians, in other words. So uh, that's another sort of similar converging story to the three that I started out with from the Assyrian perspective, from three denominations of Assyrians, by the way. Uh, interestingly, the Ottoman archives of these trials and internal Ottoman governmental discussions were purged um, twice. Uh, once, you know, 
before uh, the new sultan took over and the treaty was signed and a second time when they wanted to make a big show of opening the archives to scholars um the u.s state department claimed that there was a report that the, the archives had been selectively purged other uh confirmation or perspectives on the assyrian genocide and uh flight to other countries peaking in 1915 we could say but that not starting then um the germans quoted the ottoman minister of the interior talat pasha talking to a german embassy official telling him uh, the country the ottoman empire was taking advantage of the war to make a clean sweep of its internal enemies meaning the indigenous christians not just armenians uh other german uh diplomatic officials, whether they were from the, the east or the west of the Ottoman Empire, the north or the south, they said that the Assyrians and all Christians were being annihilated, outlawed, persecuted, and exterminated uh, according to their perspective and, and their choice of words. Similarly, the, the British scholar Arnold Toynbee in a British governmental report said there was a uniformity of procedure as between the Armenians and Assyrians. Uh, the American ambassador, Henry Morgenthau, said the same methods were applied, not just to the Armenians, but to the Greeks and other Christians. Uh, the German um, ambassador, von Genheim, uh, quoted that language I just told you about the indigenous Christians being made a clean sweep of, swept away. Uh, the Americans sent a military mission after the war uh, to do an investigation and explore aid and so forth, trade, very variety of things. Uh, and they also found that massacres and deportations of the Christian population were organized starting in the spring of 1915, uh, and that numbers of the deportees were murdered, uh, and that many women were victimized during the course of that. Uh, the U.S. Vice Consul in Ermia said that there was a similar pattern of robbing and looting the population, killing the men and women, and outraging the women. Uh, the Iranian foreign minister uh, issued a report, basically including a letter to the Ottoman Empire from the Empire of Persia, saying that it was noting and recognizing extreme violence in the Christian parts of Persia, Hermi and Salamis and so forth, where the population has been violated and mercilessly massacred by the Ottoman invader. Another uh, report was sent to the Ottoman Empire by uh, the United States by U.S. officials said that, you know, the Ottoman story that the Assyrians of Tur Abdin and so forth were in an uprising like the Armenians of Van uh, was false. There, there were no, you know, hoarding of arms or arms depots for the Assyrians to have a real rebellion before this thing all broke out. Uh, and even if the Armenians engaged in an uprising, the Catholic Chaldeans and the Syrian Orthodox Christians had nothing to do with it. So, uh, they were killed basically for not political or military reasons, but for religious and discriminatory reasons. Some of the younger uh, victims of this policy were spared to be bought and sold. There are many women and children in this position, he wrote, and some of the Christian children were being ransomed from the families, uh, but if they're reported to the government, they might do away with the children rather than accepting the ransom. So it might be better to pay the ransom, I guess the report was saying. The Allied investigation wanted to put a German general on trial for this, the theory being that he was actually in charge of the Ottoman forces uh, as, as the sort of uh, the German, Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman side of the war, acting as one. Um, and he actually had ordered uh, the massacres of Armenians and Syrians during the war, meaning Assyrians at that time, uh, the French or allied, basically, uh, commander in Istanbul was ordering this trial. Uh, he sanctioned these massacres. He was warning the Ottomans that if they stopped deporting Christian populations, the army would not be safe against attacks from the rear. And he did not deny other German officials' reports, which I already mentioned in later trial testimony uh, in Germany. Uh, just a few photographs that uh, you may or may not see in the exhibit. Uh, this is a famous photograph that may be of a massacre site in Urmia. Uh, it's reproduced in some books. Uh, Assyrian refugee girls uh, being pictured in a book by Abraham Yohanan, professor at Columbia University in the 1910s. 
Uh, this is the deportation of Armenians and Assyrians from Harput. Um, and a U.S. report at the time said that on June 18th, it was publicly announced that all the Armenians and Assyrians should leave Harput within five days. Um, and there were a variety of reports about what happened to them, uh, including a lot of the, the tactics already described. Uh, another picture, I believe, from the exhibit of, of, a, of an Armenian Assyrian and her children. Um, other Assyrian children photographed in the Russian embassy in Urmi, I believe. Uh, other refugees sort of uh, almost in rags, some of them. Um, this is a, a, a famous photo of an Armenian actually dying on a sort of forced march uh, to Syria, Aleppo, basically. Um, some Assyrians also made it to Aleppo or other parts of Syria later on, or to uh, Mesopotamia, later called Iraq. Uh, example of orphans being aided by Near East Relief or about to be aided by Near East Relief, the American organization about which I'll say more in a minute. Uh, and they're dressed in rags, like some of the other reports stated, having lost their clothes to plunder and uh, forced flight. Uh, the United States had a this group called Armenian and Syrian Relief, and they warned that two and a half million women and children were now starving to death under conditions like I just showed you uh, because of being deported, losing their houses, losing their livelihoods, losing their father in many cases or their husband, um, and being forced to flee basically on foot or being deported at gunpoint on foot. Um, similarly, there was a cablegram uh, saying that widespread famine throughout Armenia, refugees slowly starving, um, 4 million people in the vicinity of Urmia were reported perishing from hunger and exposure, 400,000 were orphaned. Um, this is from the American Committee for Relief in the Near East, Near East Relief, basically. Um, the governor of California issued a proclamation uh, Near East Relief is a semi-public organization organized by Congress, uh, is attempting to save the survivors. Uh, the heart of California has been stirred to its depths by the tragedy, which has shocked the world, and we will respond generously to the appeal for funds to alleviate the suffering of the victims. Um, they're specifically talking about Smyrna, but also uh, other uh, persons suffering from the perils of famine, disease, and privation. So did all of this happen at, due to chaos? Uh, you know, war breaks out and, and law and order breaks down and uh, the, the population turns on itself for, for criminal reasons? Or was there something uh, discriminatory or targeting about it that could be referred to as genocidal by analogy to the Holocaust or other genocides that people talk about in courts and tribunals? Uh, a lot of scholars have studied this. They said that it was not an accident what happened. There were meetings that were held about this before the war even started, about the deportation of the Christian subjects of the empire as early as 1911. Uh, German visitors and writers talked about why it would be necessary to deport Armenians to Mesopotamia or Syria or Greeks from the Istanbul region and the, the northern coast of Anatolia. Um, Clausewitz, the German military strategist, talked about you can't just target the enemy side's military forces in modern times. Each population needs to fight each other population in a demographic sense. So this is the kind of total war uh, that Germans were teaching. And some Ottomans actually went to German military academy or otherwise read German military doctrine. They were allies with Germany or wanted to be allies with Germany. So they would have taken in a lot of this planning and scheming um, to deport and wage war on entire populations of people. Then what happened, the empire became ever more insecure due to the arrival of Ottoman and Circassian refugees who had to nap homes. Uh, it was like a refugee crisis uh, due to the expansion of Austria, Hungary, and Russia in particular, and also Bulgaria. Uh, then it suffered military defeats um, at the Russian front and on the front with England, uh, close to Istanbul, uh, and on other fronts with, with Arab tribes and so forth, led by the English or helped by the English. Um, so the situation in 1915, 1916 becoming serious and desperate for, for Ottoman survival, perhaps radicalizing the leadership. Um, 
The Germans had also committed atrocities in Belgium as they experienced sort of uprisings and attacks on the rear of their forces, which were facing France. Um, German propaganda was encouraging, you know, sort of religious um, mobilization and rhetoric uh, that stirred up sort of anti-Christian sentiment, even though the Germans were themselves Christians. Um, that was a perverse effect of German propaganda. Uh, and the German, dip, one of the highest U.S. diplomats in the region said that the consistent policy of the government became the expulsion, killing, and elimination of the Christian races. In other words, confirming that it wasn't an accident. Uh, the government wrote in its internal documents, the Nestorians or Assyrians had a predisposition to be influenced by foreigners, Western missions, Russians. So the deportation and expulsion of their population from their border area with Iran is being considered, and we will not support the deportees with any aid. So what happens if people have been deported and, and lack aid, but they will die slowly. Uh, many Westerners recognized that at the time. Um, so Lady Sorma wrote about this at the border area. Um, the Republic of Turkey later confirmed it in an official uh, writing to the League of Nations. But whose country did they have to leave? Uh, Republic of Turkey said the Assyrians had to leave the country. And I've inserted their country because Turkey said it was, it was the country, like our country. They had to leave our country. They're on the wrong side of the post-war border. Um, but the country was part of the Assyrian country, is, is the next part of my talk, which is how I begin some of my books. Talking about how many of these towns have traditionally Assyrian names. Uh, if you look at a map of the Assyrian Empire, um, some of these same uh, names are in existence, like Erbil, or um, later on, uh, Marda, Mardin, Haran, the, 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 uh, the, the path or caravan town from Mesopotamia to Syria. Um, Nisibin or Nisibis means the pillars or the building in ancient Assyrian and Aramaic. Uh, Amida or Diyarbakir. Uh, Bitkari, perhaps the origin of Hakkari. Uh, Ermia, or the city on the sea in, in ancient sort of imperial, imperial Aramaic, Aramaic and so forth. Hatra in, in Syria being meaning the scepter, and Palmyra meaning the date palm. So many of these uh, places that were in the Ottoman Empire actually had Assyrian names, not originally Turkish names. They were uh, originally part of an Assyrian community, and they retained some of that identity in part up until the time of the genocide when some of them lost it and others didn't. Um, some of the, these uh, areas on a map, you can see Hakari, where Julamark is, and Urmia next to Lake Urmia, Amadia and Accra at the, uh, near Erbil at the bottom. Um, whose country was it? Well, the, the churches also tell a story. The, uh, the churches were founded between the the third and the generally the 12th or 16th century, um, long before there was an Ottoman Empire or Republic of Turkey, the religious heritage goes back that far uh, many centuries. Um, so the first part that was targeted, like I mentioned, and Lady Surma writes, is this border area, Gavar District, Murgavar Turgavar, um, Bashkala, Burwar District, and so forth. Um, and then in 1915, um, of course, Hakari, uh, Julamark, and the surroundings, the, the tribal areas, Tiari, and Takuma, and Jilu, and so forth, Baz, um, become the focus. And um, then also in 1915, Diyarbakir, uh, further to the west, Bitlis, Mardin, um, and further south, uh, Urfa, uh, and Deir el Zor, especially 1916. So as a result of all this, the Armenian population, of course, fell from, you know, 1.5 to 2 million to only, you know, a little over 200,000, 200,000, mainly centered, not no longer in the east, but in the west, Istanbul, Smyrna, and Cilicia. Uh, the Assyrian population driven from up to or, or more than 400,000 down to less than 100,000 mostly in Turabdin and Istanbul, because almost none were left in Hakkari and uh, very few in uh, some of the other areas like Diyarbakir. 
As a result of that, the Assyrians were a smaller percentage of the uh, Turkish population than the Jews were of the German population in, in the 21st century. Uh, so a, a very complete uh, destruction of, of what had formerly been, you know, one, maybe more percent of the uh, of the population, of, at least of the East. Um, and in the second phase, there was a question of whether after the war, um, Assyrians who are no longer, there's no longer a world war, Turkey and the, Russia, the Soviet Union are now at, at peace. Uh, they're helping each other. Should they be allowed to peacefully return and live in these like mostly abandoned villages? Turkish prime minister said, no, definitely not, 1923. So the Assyrians are now in Iraq uh, and the patriarch, the new patriarch writes uh, to the, basically the viceroy of the British in Iraq, the Assyrians would like recognition as a nation in Iraq, a national component and not simply a religion. They would like to have a temporal leader to inter intermediate with the, the government, with the co colonial authorities and so forth. They would like their own district to be concentrated and protected and have some administrative official participation, uh, a new home for the patriarchate, for religious education, for schools, teachers to teach the language, a civil hospital of their own, and a right to bear arms subject to local law for self-defense. Most of that was rejected. So Assyrians start to, these are pictures of some Assyrians of that time, um, trying to carry on with their manuscripts and writing and traditional dress, but uh, feeling the pressure of um, the coming independence of Iraq. Um, so in 1933, some of these tensions uh, come to a head as there's a skirmish between Assyrians and Iraqi forces I can't get into the details of. And an investigation is launched into the charges of massacre against Iraqi troops and Kurdish irregulars. Not that Iraqi troops were, ma were massacred, but the charges against them for massacring the Assyrians in Samela and the surrounding areas. Uh, in one village, 315, 315 bodies were found and 300 more in the Dohuk vicinity um, following Kurdish irregular raids. Here is sort of a montage of pictures from that time, a, a destroyed uh, village of that area from uh, British reconnaissance photographs, um, a church affected by these events on the bottom left-hand side, refugees from the events on the bottom right-hand side, and some of the Iraqi officials who were involved in the upper right-hand side, uh, along with a map of Iraq and Assyria in that time, and a survivor at the top who was interviewed and quoted in an Assyrian Policy Institute report. It wasn't just Simela though, I've circled Simela on this map. And of course the, um, the AP article mentioned Simela and Dohuk, but there were also, this, this campaign affected the Syrians as far away as uh, Ahmadiyya, Shaykhan, and Tel Kaif, and Accra, which were, you know, if, if there were supposed to be a rebellion and, and a uh, sort of a Syrian border incursion next to the river that you can see on the left side, um, why is there, so much widespread killing in these other areas that were very ill-equipped to be independent Assyrian states or anything. Uh, so it again shows some of this uh, discriminatory animus and targeting that goes beyond military necessity or self-defense. Uh, Assyrians therefore had a interesting role in the history of international law. They in, were one of the groups that got uh, Nansen or League of Nations passports because they no longer had the protection of their own country or passports from their own country. Uh, this is the predecessor to the Refugee Convention and sort of the, the refugee uh, laws of the United States after that. Um, so over this time, you've probably heard already that the Assyrian population in the United States is growing. Um, in Chicago, the Chicago land area, it grew from a few hundred um, to tens of thousands and ultimately to almost 100,000. Um, and in Michigan also to 100,000, and in California also to almost 100,000. Uh, depending on, I mean, the census doesn't always support this. So sometimes these are more informal estimates that include people who might put Iraqi on the census or Iranian or something else, Christian um, on the census. So it doesn't always match the census numbers, but these are often cited in secondary sources. Uh, so Raphael Lemkin, another, turning point in international law. One is refugee law, another is international criminal law, crimes against humanity, one of them is genocide. Raphael Lemkin develops this term to capture 
the attempted destruction or the, the denationalization, the, the denial, of a, denial of a homeland to an ethnic, national, racial, or religious group. And he mentions, you know, seven or eight examples, uh, of course, the Nazi genocide of six million Jews and several million Poles and Slavs, but also over a million Christians in the Ottoman Empire and the Balkans. Um, and later on, he also talks about Assyrians in 1933, the Maronites in 1860 in Lebanon, pogroms in 1900s early Russia, uh, pre-Soviet Russia, and the massacres of Herreros in Africa around the same, around the same time as the anti-Jewish pogroms. Uh, but these are victims of German, German colonial targeting of African tribes in what is today Namibia, basically. Um, and one of the key examples, therefore, to Raphael Lemkin was not only the Christians of the Ottoman Empire, not restricted to Assyrians, not restricted to Armenians, but secondly, the Assyrians in 1933 in Samela. Um, he also writes about how the impact on families, um, the separation of children, which we read about, uh, in the earlier excerpts that I quoted, uh, results in their being educated outside the group. And this slows or interrupts the biological reproduction of the group using the, the process of child rearing and reproduction. Um, he says this often happens throughout history. Um, and it, it results in the taking away of children from their ancestral, basically. Uh, in the ensuing sort of uh, 70 years from the, the drafting of the Genocide Convention, there continued to be destruction of Assyrian uh, villages, not only in Iraq, but in Turkey, uh, especially in the Iraq-Turkey border area. Um, so in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a lot of destruction of Assyrian towns and villages uh, around the Duri area and Barwari Bala. Uh, on the other side of the Turkish border, same thing was happening over there, especially in the 80s and 90s. Um, during the Kurdish-Turkish conflict. Um, in the 80s and 90s, almost 2 million people fled Iraq due to uh, counterinsurgency operations and the, the declaration of basically of free fire zones, prohibited zones in northern Iraq, uh, northeastern Iraq. Um, and you can see this is a map of, of refugee camps and the flight of mostly Kurds, but, but many Assyrians as well during this period. Uh, basically army and militia violence, similar to, to the 1930s. Um, on a larger scale in terms of refugee flight uh, and in absolute numbers of deaths, but maybe similar in terms of proportionate to the group uh, compared to that small Assyrian group back in the 1930s. Um, but very little recognition of, of these as a genocide, you know, even as 200,000 Kurds and their neighbors, including Assyrians and Yazidis, uh, were killed or went missing in the in the late 80s, early 90s. There was very little recognition by the rest of the Arab League, by Iran, by Turkey, that this was a genocide, even though they were recognizing, you know, mortar strikes on marketplaces in Sarajevo and other places as genocides of Bosnians. Or a, uh, a massacre in Kosovo was a genocide, according to all three of those groups in 1999. Um, and in... Uh, Later on in Iraq, when uh, after the regime change and insurgency broke out, you know, there were massacres that were similar or larger to those that had gone on in Bosnia and Kosovo, for example, of uh, Caldo Assyrians in a church in Baghdad in 2010, or of Yazidis in villages in 2007. None of those recognized as genocide either. So there was a very little effort to sort of uh, identify and interrupt using legal means this, this process. Um, so this sort of thing, it, it didn't happen the same way everywhere, but Assyrians and Caldo Assyrians were targeted in Basra, in Baghdad's Christian district, quote unquote, or Dora district uh, in Mosul, um, where I believe tens of thousands had to flee sort of multiple waves, especially by 2008. And then again in 2014, um, Kahataniya, where I mentioned that the, the killing of up to 500 Yazidis in 2007. Uh, Homs and Aleppo, after this, the Syrian civil war broke out, targeted by rebel groups, and the Christians from there had to virtually all flee, more so in Homs than in Aleppo, but uh, the majority in both places. Uh, and finally, in the Nineveh Plains in, in 2014, but also before that, 
uh, flight from ISIS and, and related groups uh, in all 6 million people displaced just in 2014, um, advance of ISIS from Syria into Iraq and almost to the gates of Erbil. Um, also, Iraq suffered continuing income poverty and undernutrition, underemployment, poor housing, uh, orphanhood, uh, and to top it all off, the, the River Tigris may run dry in a few years um, due to underdevelopment and corruption and political problems. So as a result of some of these events, ultimately Congress recognized uh, the in 2018 um, the genocide and crimes against humanity against religious and ethnic minority groups in Iraq and Syria. Uh, finding that the number of Christians living in Iraq has dropped from 800,000 to 1.4 million in 2002 to fewer than 250,000 in 2017. Um, Christians and Yazidis both fleeing the country alongside Shia and other religious and ethnic groups among the findings. There are a variety of foundations and human rights groups have visited the, the, the regions formerly occupied by ISIS and um, hosting Assyrian communities. Uh, and has found that in some of them, up to 85% of the buildings have been destroyed and the infrastructure for life. And they find it difficult to see how reconstruction could ever occur because the populations have been drained of their savings and the economic activity in those areas is depressed and reconstruction seems unlikely to them. Uh, at the same time, ancient sites were targeted and destroyed, not simply museums, but actually cities that had been partially excavated. Um, those gates and walls were then destroyed on purpose. Um, and other homes were simply purchased or occupied while their inhabitants had fled. Uh, there's an Iraqi parliamentary committee that's looking into this, but it's, it's had a lot of infighting and hasn't necessarily made much progress. Um, similarly, in Syria, uh, up to 20,000 Assyrians had to flee uh, IS group incursion in 2015. Um, the country has lost most of its GDP and uh, its annual spending on infrastructure and so forth has gone away. Um, and the whole country has lost 75% of its Christian population. So both Iraq and Syria are becoming closer to Turkey in terms of religious makeup, where they used to be this sort of safe haven, or at least in the cities, um, more tolerant of uh, Assyrian and Armenian and, and other Yazidi uh, religious minorities. The Kabul region, to which many of the Syrians fled from Semela or Hakkari uh, was basically wiped out. Um, and then Turkey stepped up its attacks on Kamishli, the more urban part of Al-Hasaka province, um, where some of the people from Kabur might have moved to if they didn't leave the country all the way. Um, in Syria, as in Iraq, many people are suffering from malnutrition, up to 12, 13 million in Syria. Um, and there are 1 million internally displaced people still in northern Iraq in 2020, uh, after 2 million refugees had already fled the country. So this has brought about the continued growth of the Assyrian diaspora as uh, Christians from Iraq and Syria have joined those from primarily from Turkey and Persia in building up the communities of Illinois, Michigan, New York, California, Arizona, and so forth. So the Church of the East in the USA had reached um, nearly 100,000 members which is almost similar to one report of its Middle Eastern uh, population. The Chaldean Catholic Church, even larger than that, more than twice as large, um, both worldwide and in the U.S., more than twice as large. And the Syrian Orthodox Church sort of being in the middle somewhere um, with up to 500,000 people in diaspora and 200,000 still in the Middle East. Um, what impact could genocide recognition have on um, stabilizing Assyrian communities or leading to repopulation or retransmission of the Syrian identity. Um, when the European Union first recognized the Armenian genocide, they wrote that the result should be in the future, fair treatment of the Armenian minority as regards their language, culture, and school system and religious architectural heritage uh, and improvements in their monuments in general. Uh, that would bring about, you know, what many countries have when, when, a, when a country becomes independent, it starts taking care of its monuments, of its graves, of its manuscripts, its constitution, its courts, its language, its literature. Um, so when a genocide is recognized, the second step is often to urge 
that the government do that on behalf of the minority population as a as a remedy or, or as a step towards justice. Um, and as a principle of international law, that any breach of it involves an obligation to make this kind of uh, reparation step, a step towards reparation. Maybe not complete reparation, but a step. Um, and in Congress, there are frequently laws passed that say, if such and such a country does not do something about its political or religious minorities, they are going to be sanctioned in some way. They're going to lose arms exports. That's what the Leahy Amendment is supposed to do. They're going to lose civilian trade. That's what the Global Magnitsky Act is supposed to do. Um, you can think of the Ukraine uh, sanctions packages in Europe. As long as the human rights of the people of Ukraine are being violated, there will be no trade of this or that kind. Um, or beyond that, many times a whole, a whole new country is carved out because of the genocide. It's believed that Bosnians can no longer live safely under Yugoslavia. Um, people of uh, maybe uh, Armenia can no longer live under Ottoman or Turkish rule. Um, East Timor can no longer live under Indonesian control. Maybe Darfur needs, if not independence, at least UN forces on the scene. Um, Myanmar, they're, they're constantly asked to do more to uphold the, the autonomy and the, the, the rights of the Rakhine or the Rohingya people. Um, and in the US Congress, there has been a step in this direction for towards Turkey, just as the European Union took it with regards to Armenians. Um, the US House of Representatives expanded it in a non-binding resolution to all the Christian groups of Turkey should receive sort of uh, reparations in terms of architectural religious heritage. So in the future, what could be done? Um, an inventory of cultural properties could be undertaken. Other countries have done this. Um, and it was done in Bosnia, for example, as a part of reconstruction in Bosnia. Uh, support for human rights groups, general human rights groups and Assyrian cultural specific human rights groups could be expanded to, to raise some of these issues closer to the focus of international and national organizations and parliaments. Uh, legislation could be passed for Assyrians and Yazidis and other minorities that are comparable to that obtained by other minority groups for their situations. Um, and there could be things like ICC indictments, um, Security Council resolutions mentioning the Assyrians, General Assembly resolutions, temporary suspensions of states from their roles on UN or other committees uh, as a conditional uh, incentive to remedy a situation. For example, Germany was basically blocked from what became the European Union until it paid reparations to Israel. Um, this is a frequent tactic threatening some country with suspension or non-admission to some group until they improve some aspect of their human rights or make rep a remedy for something that happened. Um, of course, reconstruction and uh, education on a national and, and cultural level. For further reading about these topics, I've highlighted a few books, uh, but I think I'm at the end of my time. Thank you very much. And I apologize, I won't be able to chat with you there. Uh, I hope to see you all sometime and hope the exhibit is a success for you um, and the community. Okay, thank you, Hannibal. So tomorrow I will be speaking to all of you if you come back. Um, but for now, I'd love to welcome you to the gallery exhibit. And we hope, how can I say, enjoy it. But we hope that you can connect with it. We hope that you learn from it. And you hope, we hope that you understand how strong we still are and resilient. Thank you. Thank you.